see if I can. Yeah. Uh, here we are. Yes. Can, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Sort of, but I can get the captions. <laughs> oh, you can get the captions. Yeah, thanks for setting them up. Oh, sure, sure. My pleasure. Thank you so much for uh, giving me another opportunity to talk to you on camera. So what are you up to now? Um, I have uh, taken a voluntary retirement uh, from my IBW Local 3 work as an educator. And um, I, that was my plan all along. And um, I uh, decided long ago that after a certain age, um, I will quit and uh, spend as much time as possible in India and Bangladesh. So that is what I've been doing. So are you heading back there? No, I just came back last month after being there for three months. So, uh, yeah. What's the sense of the state of things? Uh, well, the state of things is uh, good and bad. Uh, bad is that, you know, Modi and BJP and their Hindu fundamentalist mentor RSS are still in power. That's the bad thing. But the good thing is that uh, at least um, some people um, have come to their senses, so to speak. And uh, just uh, last week, as a matter of fact, there was a very important uh, state election in the southern state of Karnataka. And, I read that yeah. yeah, and the Congress party like came important. back to power big, big time. Was that a surprise? That was not a surprise because we were all hoping and praying for their win. Uh, but the way they came back so uh, impressively, so emphatically, was, was definitely a surprise. Had been strongly BJP? No, Southern states have never been strongly BJP. In fact, uh, right now, after the Karnataka elections, uh, none of the four southern states in India uh, are in BJP's grip anymore. That's so it's important. Yeah, it's a very, very important victory. So uh, that is the good side of it. And also the fact that Rahul Gandhi uh, is really uh, getting more and more popularity, a, a long deserved recognition uh, for his work and especially for the Gandhi family's work for so many years. And, uh, you know, the- uh, Is he the uh, uncontested leader of the uh, Congress now? More or less, uh, there are, there are uh, some in fights and some, you know, like political uh, bickering here and there. But uh, I think that people are slowly uh, recognizing that uh, he has changed as, as a leader and also his language has changed. He is getting to know the ordinary people more and more going to meetings, going to cafeterias, going to slums, going to colleges and universities. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a different kind of a leadership that we have not seen from the Gandhi family for a long time. Yeah. So um, I, I just uh, wanted to, um, you know, like use this very precious time to, uh, ask you some more questions. And uh, uh, I just, first of all, uh, just to remind you that I'm thinking of putting it all together, our six or seven interviews so far into some type of a book. And I'm going to send you some uh, of our present and past transcripts, just so that you know uh, what kind of discussions we had uh, for so many years. And then if you can find a little bit of time 
to write a few lines as an introduction, I would truly, truly appreciate that. I'm sure I'll have to, from experience, I'm pretty sure I'll have to do some editing because yeah. transcripts never come out very accurate. <laughs> that is true. But um, I actually, I'm doing it myself. And then I also have a little bit of uh, technological assistance uh, from a couple of young people. So I hope that it's going to be more or less acceptable, but I will definitely send them over to you. Okay, good. All right. So, um, uh, Noam, I, uh, you know, just uh, just some general questions and then some specific questions, if I may, you know, and then um, the first, the very first thing, uh, this is something that, uh, uh, you know, I've been thinking about for a long time. And you have always been such an optimistic person. You have always shown me light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. And uh, you know, uh, given that, I just would like to know from you at the outset of today's talk, um, what are some of the positive changes that you have seen personally, uh, both as um, a scholar and also as a grassroots activist in your lifetime? The easiest way to answer that question is to go back some years and see what the world was like. So and start going back to the 1960s, let's say, uh, when the contemporary wave of activism began. The period right after the war had been sort of quiescent, people trying to recover from the war and the depression and move on. Uh, early 1960s, uh, John F. Kennedy sharply expanded the war in Vietnam, laid the basis for what came uh, virtual destruction of China, no interest. Couldn't get five people together in a room to talk about it. Nobody cared. There were some meetings. They were often broken up. Couldn't have public meetings. There'd be uh, demonstrations, uh, breaking them up and so on. Couldn't meet in a church without the church being attacked. Well, by the end of the decade, that had changed radically. Strong anti-aggression movement and so on. Uh, take other issues. In uh, the 1960s, the United States still had uh, federally, uh, it had federally funded housing, but by law it was segregated, meaning blacks couldn't get in. That meant that in the great growth period of the 1950s, biggest an African-American man could get a decent job at an auto plant, but he couldn't buy a home. Uh, there were subsidized homes, but not for blacks. In the United States, for most people, wealth is property. That's what you have, not much else. That had a long, still to, up till today, a long, harsh legacy in addition to the hundreds of years of slavery, Jim Crow, repression, and so on. Well, that was the 1960s. Uh, the United States had anti-miscegenation laws so severe that the Nazis refused to accept them. Uh, one drop of blood and so on. Uh, women's rights were not recognized. Women weren't even recognized legally, legally as peers till 1975. The feminist movement was just beginning, uh, bare beginnings of an environmental movement. Uh, that was the 1960s. Well, it's pretty different today. Uh, the, a lot wrong, and that's even despite the fact that we've been through 40 years of severe regression and attack on 
basic rights and achievements, even those of the New Deal. So despite the 40 years of regression, the overall picture is starting today from a much higher plane than say 60 years ago. Uh, not a gift from the gods. It's the result of a lot of hard work, mostly by young people. Now, many of them are still the same people are still active, effective, productive, and there are many new ones have come in. Uh, young, a lot of young people involved in very effectively in uh, environmental movements, uh, human rights movements, uh, a lot to criticize as always, but plenty of engagement. I, just, I think more people, I mean, I, I do talk around the country a lot and there are many, almost everywhere you go, it's a, it's, it's a very, in many ways, very heartening uh, conditions. Some issues have changed radically. So for example, the on Israel-Palestine, until about 10 or 15 years ago, you couldn't even talk about it without police protection, literally had to have police protection on my own campus if I tried to talk about it. Totally different now. Uh, well, all of these are changes. Uh, a lot wrong. We're in a much more dangerous situation now than ever before in human history. Uh, the older generations are not doing anything about it. But younger people are really dedicated and organized, many. Unfortunately, a lot of them have just given up. You may have seen today a very shocking story in the Wall Street Journal about deaths among young people. Yeah. And known for some years that middle aged working class whites have been suffering an epidemic of uh, early deaths, which is almost unknown in the world or in history, except in war or terrible pestilence. But there's actually been an increasing mortality among working class whites. Now, today's st the report about the studies that have just come out show that that's also true of younger people, people in their kids in their teens, increasing death rates, depression, suicide, uh, homicide, guns, drugs, you know, just giving up. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Surgeon General, top medical official in the country, uh, called a medical emergency because of depression and uh, isolation among young people. He attributed it in part to social media, but I think that's kind of an instrument. It's the lack of uh, the collapse and decay of a social order has had very serious effects. So it's uh, like you said about India, it's good and bad. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I mean, believe it or not, what you just described in terms of young people uh, dying uh, and unfortunately many committing suicide is not just an American story. It's happening in India also. Um, most of the cases, it's uh, unreported. Uh, big media uh, uh, have all the time to do all kinds of trivial stories on Bollywood and fashion and whatnot, uh, but uh, you know, no time for real substantive stories that matter to the ordinary people, uh, including uh, young people taking their lives. Uh, and this is so horrible uh, on so many different counts. Uh, you know, one, one question I, I have for you is that, uh, yeah, I, I understand that the world has uh, advanced and 
it is definitely not what it used to be 30, 40, 50 years ago. And you are like, uh, you know, like a living testament of that. And we have learned uh, so much from you and your uh, personal experience to work on the ground for so many years. And I have talked about some of it with you over all these years, uh, 22, 23 years, believe it or not, uh, since my graduation days in Colombia. Uh, but even in spite of all these advances in, in you know, technology and, and education and science and arts and, and whatnot, uh, instead of the world coming together, it seems like the world is fragmenting and splintering even more on a, on a, on a macro scale. And also just the way you described it a few minutes ago, on a micro societal scale in, in so many different countries. Uh, how, do you, how do you explain that? Well, the world at the international level, uh, the, there are major changes taking place. There's a basic split developing uh, with regard to whether we're going to be moving towards a multipolar world with several centers of power and influence or whether it'll continue to be a world dominated by the United States as it's been a unipolar world as it's been pretty much since 1945 and dramatically so since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, that's a major conflict. Uh, the uh, India, like most of the global South, is moving towards multipolar structures, uh, setting up independent commercial relations outside the dollar system, uh, trade relations that are ind independent of the uh, U.S. dominated system uh, refusing almost the entire global south is refusing to become is deploring the Russian invasion of Ukraine but is not willing to join the United States in what most of the world sees by now as a proxy war between the U.S. and uh, Russia even leading commentators in the United States are now being beginning to use that term. Uh, and they're just not willing to be part of it. They're calling for negotiations and settlement, maybe along the lines of the recent uh, Chinese initiative. Uh, Middle East region, which has been in the pocket of the United States for 70 years, ever since it took over from Britain, is now drifting towards relations with China, Russia to some extent, uh, joining the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, United Arab Emirates is one of the uh, key points in the Chinese Maritime Silk Road. Saudi Arabia is beginning to set up closer relations with China and uh, the BRICS countries are becoming reanimated with Lula's re-election, uh, becoming a force in world affairs. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, the invasion of Ukraine drove Europe into the pocket of the United States, at least temporarily. Um, and that means that Europe will probably decline, industrially decline, and maybe even deindustrialization as it's breaking off from its natural resource base to the east and its huge China market. Uh, the uh, United States has used its, the basic instrument of power of the United States is NATO, and it's now extended NATO to the Indo-Pacific region uh, as trying, essentially trying to enlist Europe in the U.S. confrontation with China which is a major issue in world affairs, of course. And this reflects itself uh, 
doctrinally in what should be the basis for the new, for the emerging world order. Uh, the, uh, the South is trying to reinvigorate the institutions that developed in the 50s, the 60s, 70s, uh, UNCTAD in the United Nations, the new, econo new international economic order, new economic international information order. All of this was smashed down and defeated by mainly US power, but it's beginning to revivify uh, the uh, basic doctrinal discussion is between what's called a UN-based order and a rules-based order. Rules-based order is a phrase that was developed in the 80s under the neoliberal surge. Yeah. Uh, rules-based order means US-run neoliberalism, right. uh, which has it's described as, as a uh, uh, favoring markets and small government, but that's not the practice. It's radically interventionist in markets, strong government, but for the benefit of the very rich and the corporate sector. That's the rules-based order. And incidentally, when the United States doesn't like the rules, it justifies them. So the World Trade Organization ruled against that uh, US sanctions in Iran are illegal. The U.S. just told them to get lost. It's none of your business. You know, uh, said the same to the world court. You rule yeah. against us. Go away. It's none of, none of your business. We do what we want. So it's a rules-based order where we set the rules, and if we don't like them, we don't obey them. It became very arrogant during the Clinton years, particularly, and then expanded. But uh, the... Uh, so that's a major, and you can understand why the U.S. is opposed to the U.N.-based order. I mean, you just take a look at the U.N. charter. I mean, it pretty much rules out U.S. foreign policy. Mm -hmm. uh, take a look at Article 2, the core of the U.N. charter, bans the threat or use of force in international yeah. affairs, except in special conditions which almost never arise. That's U.S. foreign policy. Can you think of one U.S. president who hasn't resorted to the threat or use of force? And then there's them. the other main foundation of the post-war international order, along with the U.N. Charter, was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Human rights. I mean, until through the 50s and the 60s, the U.S. more or less honored it. By the 1980s, with the Reagan administration, it just openly, publicly dismissed it with ridicule. I mean, Reagan's uh, UN ambassador, uh, Gene Kirkpatrick, just declared that the socioeconomic provisions of the Universal Declaration are just a letter of Santa Claus. They don't mean anything. His, her success, uh, Paula Dobriansky, headed head of human rights for uh, Reagan and Bush uh, said, these are just a myth. Uh, they're a provocation, forget about them. Just total, not just not acceding to them, but ridiculing them. And of course the US totally defies them. That takes us back to what we were talking about before, the rise in deaths among, the rise in mortality among working class American, increasingly young people, it's very closely correlated with the undermining of the provisions that are called for in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Just take a look at Article 25, the core article. Everyone has the right to food, health care, decent living, decent working conditions. Mothers have special rights for care, the United States is off the chart on these measures. Yeah. It correlates very closely with things like suicides, deaths, and so on. It's uh, quite well studied. Of course, the correlation is very close. Of course, the dramatic rise in inequality is, contributes to that. So on the one hand, uh, 
the UN based system is basically just rejected by the United States it wants a rule based order where it sets the rules and defies them when it doesn't like it. Well, that's part of the split between a multipolar and a unipolar world. It's not that the other countries are saintly by any means, yeah. but that's a different question. Totally. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, during my 14 uh, years of uh, uh, teaching uh, critical thinking, on so many different subjects at uh, the labor union where I taught. Um, I frequently brought about the uh, subjects, uh, some of the things that you just mentioned, one being the United Nations Charter. Uh, and the second thing that I frequently brought about was the well-established uh, research uh, by a number of uh, internationally acclaimed social scientists uh, Pickett and Wilkinson uh, from England uh, published uh, the spirit level uh, in 2010, where they clearly showed the situation uh, of the United States in terms of income inequality and social and health problems vis-a-vis uh, -vis other developed countries where the United uh, States is like, like you just said, off the charts. Uh, you know, on all fronts, whether it is uh, health, whether it is obesity, whether it is child mortality, whether it is drug abuse, uh, people in prison, uh, you know, like uh, teenage pregnancy, uh, English and math literacy, uh, you name it. And uh, when I started talking about them, you know, like all these like thousands of uh, union workers that I uh, confided with, they would be like totally surprised and shocked to hear it for the first time. And uh, the first question would be, you know, like the very first impression would be, that's not true. <laughs> uh, America is the best. Uh, you, you cannot, we have some problems, but this is the best country in the world. And then I uh, would ask them to go to their breakout rooms and do their own research uh, for a couple of hours and then come back with their own findings. And after their return, they would be completely changed personalities and you know the, then the question is you know how come we never knew <laughs> so this is something that i i uh, uh, faced with all the time for for all these years uh, i recently published a book in bengali uh, and i i named it america uh, dreamland or deathland uh, and it came out from uh, calcutta and then even some of my close uh, Indian and Bengali friends, they, you know, did not like the title because they had always this uh, wonderful illusion about America being the best country in the world. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually challenging them uh, right there face to face, and they simply don't like it. So my question is, uh, you know, like uh, one of the reasons they don't like it, they, don't, they are reluctant to accept the facts, even though I have given them in the book you know, like uh, scores of references. Uh, uh, how do you actually convince people that the, uh, first of all, uh, you know, uh, criticizing your own country is not unpatriotic. That's number one. Uh, it is actually a very important part of democracy where you have a, a right to dissent and criticize. And number two, uh, how do you convince people about the fact that this so-called great American model, which has failed so miserably uh, and is being imposed on countries such as India and Bangladesh is not an acceptable model and we should not uh, go for it and actually think hard uh, and read more and analyze more about the ills that this model has brought about. Well, just to start with, I happen to have on the pile of books next to me a chart. I don't know if you can see it. It's from the... Yeah, that is the chart I was talking about, Wilkinson and Pickett. Exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, yeah, health and it, health and social problems. Yeah. Uh, compares if this is inequality, and then social problems which correlate very closely, and one country is off the chart, <laughs> literally off the chart. That's the United States. Yeah. First inequality, but way off the chart in terms of social problems. That's right. And it's pretty remarkable to look at, especially when you think that the United States has extraordinary advantages. I mean, it's a huge, homogeneous country, enormous natural resources, total security, no enemies anywhere nearby, you know, overwhelming power. I mean, back in the, even in the 18th century, it was one of the richest countries in the world. By the 19th century, richer than all the European countries put together. But with all these advantages off the chart. And there's a pretty good reason for it. Uh, you look at history, the United States kind of was a blank slate. You wiped out the indigenous population, brought in slaves, so you have cheap cotton, open land, uh, no feudal structures. Feudal system was very ugly, but at least people had a place in it. If you were a serf, it's a rotten situation, but you had some right. In a country with no feudal system background, you had no rights. Strong business community, very class conscious, always fighting a bitter class war, much more unified than, and powerful than European countries. It was a real battle. I mean, you look at American labor history, very violent. Uh, the, there, was a, there have been upsurges late 19th century, but it was crushed, almost destroyed by Woodrow Wilson's Red Scare, came back in the 1930s, gave us the New Deal and so on. But since then, a strong effort to beat it back. Then comes the neoliberal years, which are just class war. It's always what they are. We even have measures of it. So as you've probably seen, the Rand Corporation yeah. published a study of the transfer of wealth from middle class and working class to the top 1%. It's about $50 trillion during the neoliberal years. And Reagan and Thatcher, who initiated the neoliberal programs, they and their advisors understood this very well. Their first act, first act was to attack the labor movement, yeah. to undermine it, to open the doors for the corporate sector to move in with illegal methods of strike breaking. Clinton came along, his policies of deindustrializing for the benefit of the corporate sector, they could get cheaper labor in Northern Mexico, uh, major attack on unions. And uh, so it's continued. That's unions are the main line of defense against uh, in class war. So it was necessary to beat it back and destroy it. Actually, one of the optimistic today is you're seeing the bare beginnings of some revitalization uh, in many sectors, partly in industry, uh, partly in places like Amazon, Starbucks, but partly in the Tinker's movement, which is a very interesting one of the elements of neoliberalism, which is closely related to what you were saying, is the attack on education. There's been a major attack on education, defunding of schools, defunding of universities, imposing of a business model, lots of administrators, but cost effectiveness for instruction. So get rid of the Professors use adjuncts, graduate students, cheap labor. You don't pay them anything. You can get rid of them. Uh, all of that is and uh, skyrocketing wages. This has been a very conscious effort to destroy public education. Conscious, like the leading thinker of the neoliberal movement, uh, Milton Friedman, 
quite openly said there shouldn't be public education. In fact, there shouldn't be public goods at all. No health care. As Margaret Thatcher said, if you're a homeless person, it's your problem. Can't appeal to society to help you. There's no society, except for the very rich, of course. They have plenty of society. Chambers of commerce, uh, trade associations, uh, business roundtable, all kinds of rich structure, but not for everybody else. You're out there in the market, try to survive somehow. And no public goods, no education. And the educational programs themselves, unfortunately, this is bipartisan, have been to effort to undermine critical thinking. It's called teaching to test. You're a sixth grade kid. You have to study what is going to be in the test. Don't think. If you're interested in some topic, too bad, can't look at it, you got to pass that test. Uh, and you know what it's like. To, this is These are ideas that were ridiculed in the 18th century, it was compared with uh, pouring wassail, water into a vessel and letting it drip out. And of course, you forget everything. Since you had no interest in it, you forget anything you studied. And we've all had experiences like this. You, take a course you weren't interested in, uh, studied for the exam, passed the exam, a couple of weeks later, you forgot what the course was about. Uh, but that's Obama, Bush, uh, strict teaching to test, gives you metrics, you can get numbers, you can take money away from the schools if they don't pass, uh, uh, and also get rid of... Uh, way over classrooms. An elementary school teacher may have 50 kids in a class. About all you can do is try to keep them from killing each other. You can't right. do any teaching. No arts, no, no, no humanities. We don't want to waste time on that kind of stuff. Just train for the job market. Uh, all of that has been a purposeful successful attack on the critical thinking, which is, as you said, essential for overcoming these problems. And in class war, it makes sense. You don't want an educated, thoughtful public if you're gonna be battering them over the head, stealing $50 trillion from them. You want them to look somewhere else, not at what's happening. And that's where you get the demagogues, the Trump types, Bolsonaro types, look somewhere else. Don't look at the structure of the institutions that's crushing you. Look at immigrants, uh, yeah. black people, um, transgender people, anything else, just not us, you know, it's uh, yeah, what what you what you just described is uh, uh, I was just listening to you uh, carefully. I was like, uh, you know, uh, uh, laughing inside because uh, that's exactly what's happening in India today. Uh, you know, like taking all the uh, non-profitable uh, 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 subjects away from uh, school and college curricula, and there is absolutely no uh, urgency or no desire uh, for the parents and and the students to uh, study history or uh, philosophy or literature or anything like that. It's all like you want to be you want to be rich and you you become rich by uh, going to uh, IT or engineering or you know medical sectors and that's all you study. You don't really have to do anything else. That should be your goal of life. And uh, uh, and at the same time, uh, all the uh, you know like uh, vernacular schools like Bengali medium schools and, and other you know like uh, uh, very famous schools. For example, I went to a Bengali medium uh, school from grade one to high school. Uh, the school was named Scottish Church Collegiate School. Uh, a missionary established it, it in long time ago in 1830. Uh, when the Britishers came, uh, and and uh, all these old, uh, you know, like non-English medium schools are are being destroyed 
uh, in the develop name of development and progress. And, you know, like uh, uh, what is happening is that, uh, especially in India, uh, what you just described uh, is so true in India that simply there is no, uh, no desire for people to do any kind of critical thinking anymore. You just pass the test, do well in exams, and then you go for a job. That's all you do in your life. There is absolutely no reason to think, period. And, and just like you said, you know, like uh, if you are talking about Bolsonaro or Trump, look at Modi or Shah in India. I mean, they are completely destroying the, uh, you know, uh, semi-socialistic system that India had for such a long time. Uh, and the healthcare costs and the education costs have skyrocketed. Unbelievable. I mean, I don't even understand how the ordinary people make a living there. It's just beyond, beyond uh, imagination these days. So that is happening. Uh, and then at the same time, we were talking about the rise of the demagogues uh, and the rise of hate, uh, rise of uh, bigotry, and rise of uh, politics, politics of violence in the name of religion, uh, is just like uh, simply, you know, uh, out of control. Uh, and I need to hear something from you so that people can be a little bit reassured that this is not the end of it. This is there has to be there has to be a way out. How do you fight back against this often, uh, you know, propaganda based? Uh, development model where what is happening is actually destruction of democracy and free speech and diversity and tolerance. We know the method perfectly well. It's been the one that's been used through history. It's uh, hard work. It starts with encouraging critical thinking taking a look at the facts of the world, dismantling, removing layer after layer of illusion and propaganda, just as you were describing before, then organizing, undertaking actions, uh, pressures, political, in the streets, wherever it may be. It's the way you bring about change. That's the way the New Deal came about in the United States. It's the way abolition ended. It's the way human rights were. Abolition succeeded uh, finally after centuries, actually beginning in Africa with Portuguese slaves then picked up in the European countries. Then uh, women's rights slowly being realized by no means 100%, but big steps forward. Native American rights in the United States, tribal rights in Brazil, uh, the uh, concern for opposition to aggression and violence, uh, um, all of these things, you're always fighting a battle. Uh, the, the ones who Adam Smith called the masters of mankind. Masters of mankind. The economy, economy, they never stop. They're fighting all the time. If you give up, they win. So don't give up. Yeah. The teachers now just take teachers and like where I live, Arizona, very reactionary legislature wants to destroy the public education system. Uh, it's, it's a the teachers are not unionized. It's a an anti union state, but teachers are organizing, demanding that the legislature fund schools. Uh, they have rotten salaries, but that's not all they're calling for improvement that they should. Getting plenty of public support, pressuring year after year to force the legislature to react to referendums that are calling for improving the schools. Gradually, you get to, to do some things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, that is, that is, I just wanted to hear one more time from you because you've uh, you've said that repeatedly uh, to me and to so many other people, and I, I already knew what your answers would be. Um, I just, I just, you know, through through all these talks that that you and I had over the years, 
and I I've saved them all uh, for for myself and uh, my friends and family and for all the students and uh, well wishers that I have. Um, and every time I speak with you, I know I get I get a new sense of uh, reassurance and hope, and uh, I get energized. And that has always been one of the reasons uh, to talk to you because I, I I always want to come back to you, and uh, and uh, Noam Chomsky, you know, being the searchlight uh, uh, for people like us who are who are who are searching for a light that can show them the right right path to go down. So that is that is why I come back and talk to you uh, from time to time. I just want to, you know, like uh, have uh, ask you one one personal question, if I may. You know, like uh, I I have been a, a first generation immigrant in in the United States, and uh, you know, like this is my thirty uh, eighth year of living here in the states, which was completely unthinkable beyond my uh, wildest imagination uh, before I came to this country. Uh, it just happened. Uh, I've written about it in my memoir and things like that. Uh, but uh, there has always been, you know, like a, a sense of uh, frustration. And uh, and that's because, you know, what I call journalism of exclusion, I think I've told you a number of times, that media never really mentions about people like us, as if we simply do not exist. You know, I mean, first of all, the British went to India and destroyed uh, uh, the country and looted all the money and all the wealth. And in 200 years, they transformed uh, one of the richest countries in the world to one of the poorest. You know, and 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 then they they created uh, Hindu Muslim uh, bloody divide and some of the worst uh, communal riots and and then the uh, far right wing RSS came and killed Mahatma Gandhi and we all know that history. So we grew up in that kind of uh, of uh, you know hopeless uh, violent environment, and uh, then I come to the United States and with all. Uh, I'm not just I'm not just talking about me. I'm just talking I'm talking about people like me, you know, with our la beautiful Bengali language and our Indian history and heritage, uh, our food, our lifestyle, uh, you know, uh, you name it, uh, full of treasure. And here, after having been here for 38 years, it has yeah. always been this uh, sense of frustration that we are completely unrecognized. You know, like uh, uh, our our uh, labor is taken advantage of, our intelligence uh, is taken advantage of, and we have contributed so greatly to this country. And yet, you know, there is no, I mean, outside of our own uh, known world of beautiful American friends and students and neighbors and whatnot, we are completely unrecognized. How do you actually survive and flourish through that kind of an extremely stifled environment, isolated environment? That is my personal question to you. Well, here's a note of optimism. Take England and it, India. It's exactly as you described. India in the 18th century was the richest country in the world. British invaded, robbed higher, Indian technology, deindustrialized it, destroyed it. Recent population estimates are that the British may have killed about 100 million people during the period of their domination of India. You look at it for centuries in England, nothing was said. It was all, we're bringing Christianity, wonderful civilization to the backward Indians. In recent years, it's changing. For the first time, the, there's an exp beginnings of exposing the horrors and brutality of British rule in India. You're getting scholarly work. It's coming to students are demanding that you get rid of the vestiges of imperial violence. Uh, the population in England's beginning to understand it. It's after a couple hundred years. 
you mentioned 38 years. This is centuries, but it's finally beginning. Now in the United States, it's a difficult situation. Uh, as you know, there's this theory of the great replacement. Uh, the Democrats are trying to bring in non-whites, non-Christians to destroy our white Christian civilization, uh, and which was so lovely and perfect where colored people knew their place. And well, you can't just laugh at it. It's real. These are people who are really being bettered by the neoliberal programs. You go to a rural town where it's the center of these things. Uh, the jobs are gone. The young people are leaving. The stores are closed up. Uh, all that's left is the church and the bar. It's very easy to fall into the belief somebody's doing this to us, some bad people. Like in Germany in the 1930s, it was the yeah, Jews. Right. right. So, and in India, it is the Muslims now. <laughs> yeah, it's the, it's the Muslims, you know, go after them. But uh, every demagogue understands this, and there's a basis for it. The, the basis is the kinds of things we were talking about before. The Will it pick a chart? The... Um, mortality and so on, the breakdown of society. It's there. And the way to overcome it is to deal with that problem where it is. I mean, the United States, after all, had anti, had immigration laws, which the 1924 immigration law was aimed at Italians and Jews. It sent... Yeah. And endless numbers of Jews to the concentration death camps because they couldn't get into the United States. This lasted until the late 60s, okay? My relatives all killed, you know. It's, uh, well, at least we've overcome that. So now it's the people fleeing from the destruction of Central America by U.S. terror, being stopped at the border, sent into concentration camps separated from children, separated yeah. from parents. It's a monstrosity. The only thing, good thing you can say about it is Europe's worse. And there they let them drown in the Mediterranean, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, but these are things you're just going to have to struggle with and fight all the time. And I'm afraid right now, I'm afraid I have to go off. To no, that's that's okay. Just just one last one, one line uh, answer from you. Uh, you know, Noam Chomsky, uh, my mentor, and my heartfelt thanks and regards to him. Uh, how do you uh, see Noam Chomsky legacy saved? It's up to other people, not to me. I don't. We, I do. we shall yeah. definitely do other... our best to, uh, to educate a... people. It's a cooperative enterprise. Yeah. Great to see what you're doing. I wish I could stay with you longer, but I got another one coming up in two That's minutes. Okay. That's okay. Thank you very much. We'll talk more in the coming months. Great to see you again. Thank you, Norm.